Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a nice sunny Friday morning where I am. I hope you guys have got nice weather. Uh, we are about to have a really interesting discussion about cycle parking. Uh, this is the 14th Land or Links Green Transport Recovery webinar. Uh, they've been really well attended. There's been some fantastic um, question and answers, some fantastic speakers. We've got a great lineup for you today. Uh, we're going to be talking about cycle parking. We know how important it is to uh, enable more people to cycle. People want to cycle, but if they can't park their bike at their destination, it's a massive problem. Uh, I think government policy is certainly going in the right direction in terms of um, cycle parking uh, recently, and there's been a big push, particularly uh, cycle parking at railway stations. And uh, we've got a speaker today who's going to be talking about that specifically. Cycle parking is also something that's come up in the Emergency Active Travel Fund. So local authorities can apply for cycle parking as part of their funding allocation. And you may have seen the funding allocations for Tranche 1 went out yesterday. Um, most councils did pretty well. A few uh, have got a bit more room to, uh, to, to grow, so to speak, and need to be more ambitious in Tranche 2. But we're really hoping that um, the... Um, that that money will be used for cycle parking or some of that money will be used for cycle parking. So uh, we've got a great lineup for you today. We're going to be exploring implementing temporary and permanent schemes, understanding cycle parking needs, where's the current and potential demand, supporting access to the high street and urban centres, improving access to public transport and mobility hubs, embedding cycle parking within planning frameworks, developing and implementing cycle parking standards. So I'd like to very much thank CyclePods who are the sponsor of this webinar today. Uh, these events would not happen without the sponsors and also uh, all of the people from Land or Links that have made this happen. There's a massive team effort, group effort behind the scenes that, to make this happen. Um, and also uh, we will, we really want to hear your questions. So there's a question box and uh, please send in as many questions as you can. We'll do as best to get them answered. We've got a really good stretch of time, about 40 minutes, I think, for Q&A. And if questions don't get answered uh, in the Q&A, then we'll try and get them answered um, offline. So our first speaker today uh, is um, William Knighton, who works for Chiltern Railways. He is the stakeholder manager and for integrated, so he's a stakeholder manager and integrated transport manager. And uh, he's going to be giving us real life experience of what it's like to work in a train operating company. So um, over to William. Hello, and thank you very much for that introduction. Um, as Adam said, uh, I'll be here to talk about cycle parking from the perspective of a train operator. So, um, as you heard, I'm William Knighton, we're the stakeholder manager and the integrated transport manager here at Chiltern Railways. My contact details will be at the end of the slides here. So, if there's anything at all that I talk about or discuss that you'd like to directly talk to me about after this, then do please get in touch. So, from the outset, it's important, I think, to be clear of who we are and what we do. So we at Chiltern Railways are in the business of moving large numbers of people quickly and efficiently, most of the time, across distance. We are also responsible for the stations and the immediate station area. Now, quality bicycle parking that complements rail journeys is an important facet of the broader customer experience, our customers who travel with us on a day-to-day -day basis or indeed as leisure travellers. Um, and on that point, it's, uh, we're very pleased that uh, the latest transport focus National Rail Passenger Survey released yesterday gave us a 76% satisfaction score on our bicycle parking facilities against a national um, uh, average of 61%. But clearly, there's work for both the industry and for ourselves to do to improve this further. So these on the screen now are the broad themes that I'll be touching on today in what will be quite a brief remark, quite a high level just overview of, of, of how train operators or Chiltern Railways specifically conceptualize and think about what cycle parking is for, where it needs to go and how we prioritize it and work with partners to deliver it. So first of all, why cycle parking? Well, 
stations are obviously travel hubs and it's important that high quality bicycle parking infrastructure is available for those looking to access the railway on their bicycle as adam said if parking provision does not exist or is low quality or inappropriate then people simply will not cycle now a rail journey by definition is one part of a broader journey almost all of the time people get from their origin point to their initial station make their rail journey and they complete their journey from there you've got a first and last mile problem and uh, bicycles are a great way of resolving that so we don't just put in cycle parking for the sake of it we do it because we want to enable cycle rail journeys there's a few different facets to this there's obviously the sustainability aspect Shorten railways and our parent company Areva are committed to encouraging sustainable travel choices from our customers and indeed as businesses on a corporate level to also act sustainably there is a commercial element too. So one of the constraints on our growth is, or perhaps was, and we'll get to that at the end of this, um, car parking. So particularly at our uh, sort of outer suburban commuter stations into London, um, the car parks there are getting very full indeed, which can put people off from traveling to the station if they're not guaranteed a car parking space, or maybe they'll just drive the whole distance or even worse, drive to a competitor. So installing, cycle parking rather than just tarmacking over yet more space for cars is a good way just to encourage people to to, to make the decision to make the choice to um uh, to move over to a bicycle it's sort of a build it and they will come approach i suppose and as i mentioned at the outset there's also just a obvious customer experience benefit to having quality bicycle parking so to go into a bit more detail if we go to the next slide as the customer if you like for um uh, for you know, the, the supply of bicycle parking facilities i need to be clear that there's not really such a thing as a one-size-fits-all solution that works for all locations across all communities so on the uh, slide you should be able to see a picture of the existing racks at Marlborough station our main london terminus which has a very different end user experience and people who use it have very different expectations of what that will be for so what we find is that generally people get to their origin station maybe they'll drive or be dropped off or perhaps cycle somehow get to Marlborough, and then they'll have the bicycle left there overnight which they'll cycle to their office back to the station in the evening leave it there and back home if you're leaving your bicycle overnight somewhere the expectations the requirements and security are that much higher compared to if you're just leaving it during the day and you'll be back in the afternoon to collect it and that different expectation needs to be included as part of the specification and design of any uh, new systems or improvements to these systems um obviously good signage good visibility are a commonality that's important wherever your cycle parking is it needs to be visible people need to be aware it's there and needs to be convenient to use so our brand new parking facilities uh, which are going in as we speak at Aylesbury Princess Roseborough and High Wycombe are all designed with that very much in mind they're designed to a high standard and also just to provide a good user experience so double tier gas assist new lighting uh, repair stand with tools air pump all that sort of stuff just to make it as easy as possible as convenient as possible to access the railway on a bicycle. Now, we are hamstrung in one pretty critical way that we just don't have, as a company, enough data on the travel choices that people make and how they're using our cycle um, uh, uh, facilities. So in particular, we don't know where people are coming from and going to at either end of that journey, whether they are current cyclists or current non-cyclist customers. We also don't really have great data on the usage of our racks. Sort of on an anecdotal basis, we might get updates from frontline teams of how many uh, empty spaces are there. When it comes time to bid for uh, an improvement or fund a new improvement, we'll maybe do a bit of an audit to see where the um, capacity is getting a little bit squeezed. But on a day-to-day -day basis, we do need, I think, to do a little bit more to understand better how the racks are being used and how we can just continue to offer an improvement to customers, both in terms of numbers, but also in terms of the quality. Um, I will also say that there's some other things that we as a talk are missing, some others do it better. I think you'll hear a little bit further on a pretty good example. So we don't really do much at the moment to cater for oversized bikes because we don't see them on the network. 
because we don't cater for it. And there's a chicken and egg problem there, which we need to unpick. And similarly around e-bikes, I think there's a lot of thinking that the industry is doing at the moment on you know, what are the different requirements for e-bikes in terms of security, safe storage, all that kind of stuff, which we need to I think, raise our game on. So if we go to the next slide here, um, so our core business is running trains on time, most of the time at least, we do try. Uh, we want to support sustainable travel choices of, uh, for our customers, but to do that in a holistic way, we work with partners and with third parties. There might be the Department for Transport, local authorities, transport agencies like Transport for the West Midlands or Transport for London, um, or, even, or even our community groups and local cycling groups as well. Part of the reason for this is that funding is pretty critical. So we've been quite successful historically at securing funding from successive rounds of the Department for Transport Cycle Rail Fund, um, and also working with local partners such as Transport for the West Midlands. Uh, so the uh, Solihull upgrade is pictured on the uh, top right there that went in last December, and um, funded by them. Um, our posture then is a little bit reactive a lot of the time. There'll be a funding opportunity, and we'll reach for it and go for it and we'll you know, uh, engage with the local authorities and relevant transport authorities to get this stuff done because cycle parking is one part it's an important part but it's one part of a broader process of encouraging cycle rail journeys a lot needs to happen outside of the red line of the station and the, the railway land to properly encourage cycle rail integration a good example of this is at wendover a commuter um, uh, town in Buckinghamshire, relatively near to Aylesbury. Uh, we put in a new cycle hub there, so doubled the, the number of spaces to about 200 or so. But we also worked with Buckinghamshire, the county council, to upgrade the approach road and um, the, the roundabout off the main road into the station, as it was quite dangerous. Quite a few HGVs servicing a light industrial area a little bit further down. And you know, if we just focus on the parking aspect, we lose out on that wider accessibility piece of how people are getting to and getting from the station. Now, we as a railway operator can't do that on our own. If it's outside our land, our hands are tied. So we need to work and we do work with um, local partners. And there's some examples here of what we've been able to achieve. So I mentioned Solihull, uh, Bista Village, um, being opened up there with uh, new cycle racks and the uh, local community turning out to, you know, to, to welcome these things. And then the Waterston Greenway between the uh, DFT and uh, Sustrans, uh, this very high quality Dutch style walking and cycling route from Aylesbury Rail Parkway Station to Waterston Manor, which I think is Buckinghamshire's most visited tourist attraction. It's well worth a, it's well worth a visit. Um, and you know, it's the sort of thing which we on our own would never be able to do, but we can support and empower others to connect with the railway to better serve the, uh, the community that use it. So, if we move on to the final slide, I think I'm slightly, yes, uh, <laughs> need to close. Um, I hate to mention the C word, but uh, somebody has to. These are strange and difficult times. Public transport will be operating with a reduced capacity for some time. We need to start thinking now about how we want our towns, our cities and communities to weather the storm and how we want to rebuild afterwards, how we want to build back better. So we've made immediate changes to uh, make cycle rail travel easier, particularly for those traveling into London who perhaps don't, won't want to switch onto the tube or the bus. So we've waived the season ticket requirement, for example, to use the secure cycle parking at Marylebone. We're working with Westminster on temporary um, uh, and in the longer term permanent upgrades to cycle routes from the station. So of course, the, the lovely new Park Lane uh, route around Hyde Park is only five minute cycle from Marylebone. I do find it interesting that this has been described as a temporary pop-up lane. If you go and look at it, it's quite concrete, quite literally so. But um, anyway, uh, I shall wrap to a close now. There is a lot of funding on offer at the moment from central government and indeed from some other sources. It's, I think, quite critical that we make the most of the funding that's on offer and deliver improvements both to the parking itself, but also what I've been trying to talk about today, about going beyond the station. Um, the other speakers, I look forward to hearing from them on further insights on you know, what quality cycle parking looks like. What I've tried to do here is just give a bit of an overview from a TOX perspective of what the idea is and why we value 
cycle parking to begin with. So thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. My contact details are on the screen. Uh, please do get in touch with me and I'll be around for the Q&A at the end of the presentations. Thank you. Thanks very much, William. That was a fascinating insight into what a train operating company is facing in these challenging times. So next up is Chris Donaldson, who works for Sistra. Uh, Chris, welcome to the webinar and uh, look forward to hearing what you've got to say. Hi, thanks very much, Adam. Yes, uh, so uh, as you said, I'm uh, Chris Donaldson. I work for Sistra. Um, so uh, again, uh, thank you very much to uh, Psychopods for hosting and uh, Lando Links for helping us set up uh, all of the uh, technology to make this work. Uh, it's been pretty smooth so far, so uh, that's, uh, that's really helpful. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, our data-driven data approaches for cycle parking uh, in London. So um, over the past few years, Sister has been working on uh, both kind of citywide uh, and more borough-specific cycle parking plans um, that are, are based on a number of different uh, data sources. Um, that uh, have come through both from ourselves, from TFL, uh, and from a number of other organizations. So, um, move on to our first slide. So, of course, um, the, the Mayor's Transport Strategy in London has set out some, some very ambitious targets for uh, cycling in London. So, we're, we're looking at 80% of trips uh, to be made by sustainable modes by 2041, uh, and it looks like uh, in order to make that happen, we're going to need to shift from 2% of trips uh, back in 2015 to, to 7 to 10% of trips uh, in 2041. And uh, previously, TfL had come out with uh, you know, many plans and strategies. There's the, the Cycling Action Plan um, for, for routes and, and to get, uh, get uh, different areas of the city connected, uh, and also a Walking Action Plan, um, but it was realized that there wasn't a Cycle Parking Action Plan. Um, so that's where we came in. Um, we were commissioned to, to put this together for TfL uh, and it involved a collation of uh, tons of different data sources in order to understand where people were coming from, where they were going to, how long they were staying in those locations, what types of locations they were. Um, and uh, so we, we were working on that kind of data front uh, as well as also a significant amount of uh, stakeholder engagement. Um, so with talks uh, with TfL itself um, and with uh, local authorities to understand what uh, people in the borough needed from cycle parking. So um, essentially the, the key is here that uh, the mode shift that the mayor's transport strategy sets out cannot really be achieved if there's not a significant increase in, in cycle parking. And that's, that's really across London, uh, both in the, the inner boroughs, the city of London um, and the, the outer boroughs. So um, one kind of key thing that we found over the last uh, few years is that a lot of schemes that go in, so developments, uh, upgrades to rail stations, will actually have cycle parking built in uh, from the get-go. Um, but, but often what will happen is that uh, funding changes, there's changes to the program, and the, the cycle parking either kind of falls out somewhere along the way or it will be changed in some meaningful way. For example, the, the quantity that's uh, available is shrunk or, or the, the quality is not quite what we need. Um, or for example, it is it's just slightly uh, away from the, the um, expectations that we would need uh, as set out uh, below. So we, we see, you know, as William said earlier, there's a huge difference uh, in the context. It, it, cycle parking cannot be kind of one size fits all. Um, uh, it needs to accommodate, you know, all sorts of different parking purposes. For example, uh, in Marlborough Station, you've got, you know, people parking overnight versus outside of a shop, which would be for a couple of minutes perhaps, uh, but also needs to accommodate all different types of cycles. So you've got your, your e-bikes, um, which are becoming more, more common now and perhaps you know, more expensive. Um, people would, would feel more comfortable parking them in, in a more secure environment, um, but also larger bikes of different dimensions, recumbent bikes, uh, cargo bikes. So it really is uh, a, a, an accessibility issue as well. Um, but in general, we need to be looking for cycle parking that's visible, that people can actually find if they get to the destination, it's not tucked behind the station somewhere, uh, that's accessible uh, and actually allows them to park close to their destinations uh, without dismounting. Uh, that's a key bit uh, with, with a lot more of this kind of on-street parking that allows people to kind of pull in directly. Um, secure, of course, uh, easy to use and fit for purpose. Um, so that again goes back to catering for all different types of cycles, uh, available so enough, uh, of course, and, and then well-maintained 
um, as people you know tend not to want to park their cycle somewhere where there's a lot of different wheels uh, and other bits and pieces kind of uh, latched onto to the infrastructure. Uh, and the last bit uh, that isn't written down here is uh, integrated, so it does need to uh, ensure that it's not adding to the street clutter uh, or, or any other street um, uh, bits and bobs that are going to get in people's way. Okay, so let's move on. So on a, the, the kind of city-wide level, uh, Citra assisted with uh, creating this cycle parking Im implementation plan. So what we did with this was uh, collate a, a, a vast variety of different data sources in order to understand where cycle uh, parking was going to be required. So uh, this looked at things like the cycle infrastructure database that Citra also worked on uh, previously. Uh, that was an audit of over 200,000 uh, cycling assets all throughout London, uh, and that's available uh, and can be can be seen uh, in, in various places online. Uh, the Propensity to Cycle tool, which is available both for London and outside London. Uh, the Cinnamon Demand Model, um, potential and switchable cycling trips, um, but then also more specific. So we've got um, uh, you know trips uh, specifically to rail stations. We've got uh, an audit of all of the residential cycling hangars. Um, of course, the, the Star Cycle Parking Delivery, um, that was uh, an audit of locations that cycle parking had been delivered uh, in schools. So, so a really wide range uh, of different sources went into creating the cycle parking implementation plan. Uh, and below you can see on the left, uh, this is just the outputs from the cycle uh, infrastructure database, the CID, uh, and this uh, shows kind of the spread of cycle parking with the uh, major stations and town centres circled. Uh, and then on the right is an idea of, of where the real key locations for additional cycle parking are. And you can see some um, kind of matchups with what you probably already know uh, about cycle parking and cycling in London. Um, for example, at Hackney, um, it seems to require significantly fewer cycle parking spaces in the future, future than uh, some of the other central London boroughs and locations. Um, so they, this, this probably does match up with, with some expectations, um, but it does also show that there's a significant way to go in terms of delivering more cycle parking across the city. Okay, so moving on. Um, through this process, so we did do kind of a holistic overview of cycle parking throughout the city, um, but we also uh, identified a number of key challenges um, in, in different types of locations where a, a more kind of bespoke approach was necessary. So for example, in, in workplaces, uh, we have this issue of 50% you know, of people uh, in London report being uh, not being able to park uh, at their work. Uh, and, and this is something that we, you know, ha having kind of a limited view on, on how many workplaces have cycle parking and the quality uh, and capacity of that cycle parking, um, also struggle with when putting together the implementation plan. Um, so for workplaces, we, we have a couple of action plans. So for example, working with business improvement districts to build uh, large scale cycle hubs that everyone can use uh, and developing some accreditation for uh, high quality cycle parking uh, in office to, uh, for office developers. So there, there's some sort of standard to be working to. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of these um, here, but uh, we've also got, you know, for example, uh, transport hubs, uh, again, as William was speaking about before, uh, transport hubs are really, really key and will become even more important um, uh, during this uh, strange time when uh, you know, people uh, are going to need to try and make as many trips as possible by, by walking and cycling. Um, we've also got high streets and town centres uh, where there, there is an additional need to, to ensure that any new kind of street scheme or placemaking scheme does include high quality cycle parking uh, along the lines of what uh, the, those elements that I was speaking about before. Uh, residences uh, trying to retrofit estates uh, and council homes with uh, additional cycle parking. Places of education, uh, this is an opportunity where we can uh, deliver probably lower cost cycle parking as the schools themselves are quite secure. Um, so an opportunity to kind of get uh, good value out of cycle parking. And then uh, community destinations is one that's um, more of an umbrella term for, for all sorts of different locations that people uh, might want to cycle to, but currently uh, are limited in terms of their, their parking at the destination. So the, the final plan uh, for the, the CPIP was released last year, um, and it, it does set some very ambitious targets um, for the uh, amount uh, of new spaces that are going in. So we've got, uh, for example, at stations, four and a half thousand stations, uh, 
four and a half thousand sp uh, locations for sorry circuit parking spaces uh, should be delivered uh, over the next few years in stations in central London and then seven thousand uh, for the rest of London uh, and then as I was saying before there's actions for each uh, type of stakeholder in those challenge areas um, costs and identifying funding is of course the the, the big challenge uh, particularly at the moment there was uh, a significant amount of funding, three million, uh, secured for cycle parking, uh, and a lot of that is now kind of being repurposed uh, and and allocated in slightly different ways. But a lot of that will will come forward in the second uh, round of funding for for COVID measures, uh, and is already being being included in uh, street space plans uh, for different boroughs in London. So um, that is kind of it, the the method of delivery is slightly different, um, but the the funding is going to be there in in, in different ways. Uh, as a result of coronavirus and, and our approach and response to that. Um, but uh, the, the real key again is that uh, all new cycle parking needs to be usable by, by anyone um, who, who wants to use it. So it does need to cater to those non-standard cycles and needs to be inclusive for things like cargo bikes and electric bikes. Um, and it cannot always be one size fits all. So this is uh, just a, a quick review of what's happened so far since uh, we, we finished the cycle parking implementation plan. So we have, uh, or TFL rather, has, has delivered 8,000 cycle parking spaces uh, across London. Um, those are ranging from on street in schools uh, and stations uh, and include cycle parking hangars. Um, and then they're also looking to deliver a further 1,000 spaces on the TLR in, in the coming months. Okay. So as we now move on, we're going to be talking about more kind of borough specific approaches. So uh, the CFIP was one piece of work uh, and we picked up uh, off the back of that with some more bespoke cycle parking strategies uh, uh, for the borough of Greenwich and the uh, borough of Lambeth. Uh, and we're, we're about to kick off a new one for the London Bridge area in Southwark. So these strategies were much more um, focused around key locations within each borough. So, so for Greenwich, we worked with um, the, the cycling officers there uh, to create these focus areas where uh, they expected the, the, the most uh, cyclists to be going to and from. Uh, this is where they're most intense. Uh, a lot of the, the shops and all of the um, uh, community hubs and, and locations like that were located. Um, and we, we used a lot of the same sources as for the cycle parking implementation plans so the CID. Um, but also picked up on additional site visits uh, and data that was provided by the borough to understand what the additional um, and what the existing cycle parking was like in the borough uh, in those focus areas. And, and Sister then created a new calculation methodology for cycle parking demand, um, looking at the land usage in different areas and creating a blended trips rate to understand um, the the number of trips that would be be taken to and from different locations by cycle. Uh, and then using that to project a, a current and a future cycle mode share uh, and, and the number of um, cycles that would, would need to be parking in different locations as a result of that. Um, so at the bottom there you can see the existing capacity in Greenwich uh, in the entire borough and then to the right you can see kind of Greenwich town centre with the focus area on the, the major streets uh, and areas where um, there are public locations that people might want to cycle to um, with some key uh, Kind of areas where uh, there, there's an observed occupancy that's very high or we predict that in the, the coming years there will be a very high need for additional cycle parking and then if we move on to the next slide we can see this one is for for lambeth um, that we've made some suggestions as to the exact location scale and the type of new parking that, that that's to be added in these locations um, so we really do kind of drive down into into the detail for these look at each kind of analysis block um, and, and, and see within that block or very close to that block what can be added, uh, what the scale uh, of that parking is uh, and, and if it's going to meet the occupancy requirements that we're projecting. Uh, and as a result of this, we also provide a costed spreadsheet um, of, of how much each location will, will cost to deliver and then prioritize that based on um, the, the scale of the parking required. So if we're suggesting a location based on the methodology needs another uh, 50 spaces, then it, it might come in, in batches of, of 20, 20 and 10, rather than all going at once, which allows a, a bit of a geographic spread um, of the additional uh, cycle parking uh, throughout the borough. 
Uh, and this, this essentially allows for a ready-made implementation plan for when funding becomes available. So this has been um, very useful for a number of the boroughs we've worked with uh, and that they've got something kind of oven ready to, to kick off with uh, during this time. So uh, essentially this so far has been more of a, a London focus um, with the localized uh, cycle parking strategies. But this is something that we have also started talking with local authorities outside of London with uh, about and um, it, it seems to be that the overall calculation methodology for the demand for cycle parking will be very easy to uh, translate into a non-London context and that we'll just need slightly more information uh, and maybe more site audits to understand what the current provision is uh, depending on whether or not that local authority has uh, that data listed for them already. So uh, that is coming to the end of my presentation. Um, so of course, I'll be around for the Q&A later on, but if you do have more specific questions, uh, particularly around more of the technical detail of, of how these things were calculated, please do uh, get in touch with us at the emails are below. So thanks very much. Thanks, Chris. That was uh, fascinating stuff and uh, loads of questions have come in, have come in for you. So uh, just sit and wait and we'll get to them at the end of the presentations. Just want to share one stat with you, which came in by um, Vivian from CycleHoop. Um, so CycleHoop, uh, they supply and also manage the bike ha hanger system, which quite a few London boroughs are using. I don't know whether they're being used outside of London. Maybe Vivian can, can tell us that, but they're definitely being used uh, inside London. There's been a massive uh, unprecedented growth, as Vivian calls it, in interest for the use of bike hangers. They've gone from an average of 650 roughly a month to 4,000 people who are interested, who've shown an interest in wanting to have a bike hanger on their street. So if that's anything to go by, the demand for secure cycle parking is absolutely massive. Right, we're going um, to we're going to jump from London up uh, slightly northeast, a few, about 60 miles to Cambridgeshire, and we our next speaker is Claire Rankin, who is senior project officer for Cambridgeshire County Council. And if any of you haven't been to Cambridge to cycle around, I highly recommend it. It does actually feel like you're in the Netherlands or in Denmark. So um, over to Claire. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, my name is Claire Rankin. I work in the cycling team at Cambridge County Council. Uh, I've picked a few topics from our experiences in Cambridge, which I thought might be of interest. Uh, mainly, I'm going to start off talking about cycle parking standards, uh, which was really my previous role at the City Council. Um, then I'm going to have a quick overview of our cycle parks, um, a little bit about uh, cargo bike parking, and then just some more general things about on-street parking that we've put in. And then um, Matt Danish from CamCycle is going to go on um, talking in more detail about some of these things that um, I'll be raising. So yes, uh, cycle parking standards. Uh, the Cambridge Local Plan of 2006, it was actually had quite robust cycle parking standards. Um, quite significant numbers were required for all the different types of development. But what we found was that uh, the problem was in the execution. Uh, Although they had the right number of racks, uh, there were inconvenient locations, sort of in garden sheds at the back of the garden, uh, narrow alleyways to get to them, often steep ramps. Uh, we found the architects seemed to forget that a park bike actually took up more space than a rack. So once a bike was parked, you couldn't actually get to the other racks. And um, as you can see in the, the picture on the right, um, it looks like great cycle parking for individual houses, but in fact, that was supposed to be for bin storage um, and we did find that bin security and storage was seen to be more important for developers than bike storage so you know being a, a good Cambridge resident um, took that as, as uh, bike parking and uh, as a consequence lots of bins are out on the street cluttering up the place. Um, also people park their bikes in garages as, as they do but a lot of the developments in Cambridge um, recently have been very high density, so they don't have driveways. So there's nowhere else to park cars. So again, we had rogue parking became a problem, car parking becoming a problem. So um, we did find very much that, for, certainly for Cambridge residents, it seemed to be that convenience was the all important thing um, rather than security. I mean, security was uh, important, but, but convenience was all. People, as you can see from the photos, would rather 
park their bikes on the railings out on street than use the park the official cycle parking which was out the back and and much more inconvenient to get to so um next slide please so as a result um it became obvious that we needed a better guide for developers can you um move to the next slide hello anyway i'll carry on uh it became obvious that we needed better guidance and we couldn't really find anything out there that gave as much detail as we felt was on the previous slide. Um, so we worked with transport initiatives um, to look at the level of, um, to look at various things. So could you go back to the previous slide? Anyway, we looked at uh, got more better guidance on different layouts, on uh, the different widths for corridors for um for doors uh we looked at the turning circles for people walking their bikes and particularly um i think something quite new which was the the garage layouts um and and how you could in, incorporate a car and a bike um, in the garage and also a little bit about double sackers um the next uh next guy next slide please the next local plan was the opportunity to embed those uh, that cycle parking guide in in the standards and we we looked at uh including also a bit, bit more about um inclusive cycle parking so uh making sure the ramps weren't too steep um uh, making sure there was ground floor parking if if most of the park was in the basement and also that if double stackers we we're very clear that we didn't think double stackers were suitable for residential parking you know, a lot of people in cambridge have got quite heavy town bikes they've got baskets um and it's you know unless you're fairly fit and and you've got a bit of strength uh you can't use the top racks very well unless you've got quite light bikes and say you're quite young and fit so we wanted to make sure that that there were a proportion of sort of standard Sheffield stands um, for people to use as well. Um, so we we specified that double stackers should only really be used for non-residential and the, a sort of large, say, student um, residential parking. Um, I'm sorry, there's a bit of a typo in there. That should read vertical and semi-vertical racks are not acceptable. So we were very clear about that as well. Um, and something that we would you know, in, in the new update of, of the standards, because they, they were written a little bit before 2018, took quite a long time for that local plan to go through. The number of the usage of non-standard bikes, particularly cargo bikes, has increased massively. And um, that is sort of something that's missing um, in the standards. We've, we've put in the need for space for uh, nurseries and creches, but, but not generally. So we would look for a more, flexible space for individual houses so that you can park um, larger bikes there and also designated space um, parking for um, larger communal areas and more guidance on double the, the, the design of double stackers and I know Matt's going to talk a bit more about that. Next slide please, thank you. Um, moving on, we've got a number of cycle parks in Cambridge. So I just wanted to, to um, talk about it a little bit. Uh, the first cycle park we put in was in a city council car park. So it was a really strong message at the time, removing a whole floor of car parking to put in cycle parking. But one of the things we learned from this was that location is all important and access is all important because it, it wasn't totally successful in that was only about 50% full really most of the time um, because it was slightly away from the main drag. Uh, uh, it was in the centre but it was a little bit off the main street and access a little bit awkward. So um, it didn't have the, the visibility and the prominence I think um, to be used and, and um, cyclists are <laughs> like to park right next to where they're going to go. Um, so that's a bit of an issue. but. Um, it was managed by the city council we had lockers there and it did actually end up 
having a pop-up cycle shop there, which um, became quite well established. Um, and the, this whole car park is actually going to be re rebuilt soon. So we're hoping that the access will improve because there will be a cycle park with the car park, the new car park. Um, the Grand Arcade, the, the photo on the right, uh, as you can see, it gets pretty full. Um, that was provided as part of um, a planning application for a new uh, shopping centre. So as a condition of that shopping centre being built was that we would have a, a cycle park. It's got just, just under, I think, 200, just over 200 spaces. It's free, as is um, all, all the cycle parks are free. Um, it's got a large shop and offers bike hire, uh, offers, as, as does actually the, the Park Street Cycle Park, they both offer a scheme where you can borrow a push chair if you arrive by, say, cargo bike or you've got a, a child seat. So you can just, for free, you can sort of swap your bike for a push chair to do your shopping. Um, in the case of the Grand Arcade, the, it's privately run, the private shop uh, runs that on behalf of the City Council. There is an area in the Grand Arcade for cargo bikes. Um, it's signed as such, but it's especially when it's full, it's quite often misused um, with just people parking there because there's nowhere else to park. Um, one of the issues of the Grand Arcade we found is because it's privately run, uh, the removal of abandoned bikes is uh, tricky because uh, most of the abandoned bikes are, are removed by around the city by the city councils, city rangers, and they can't actually remove bikes here because it's not open air and they use the Refuse Act to remove the abandoned bikes. Um, and because it's not a city council uh, property, they can't remove the bikes there. And the owners of the Grand Arcade at the moment don't have space to keep those abandoned bikes when they're removed. Um, so it is an issue that, that we haven't quite resolved yet. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, at the station, uh, as you can see from the top photo, it was a mass of bikes um, before. I mean, it's quite a good message. You came out of the station and saw all these bikes, and it really was the message that uh, Cambridge is a city of cycling. However, it was chaotic and there weren't enough spaces. Um, and as you can see, it was difficult. People, you'd spend sort of 10, 15 minutes trying to find a space when you arrive. So as part of the, Cam the Cambridge Station redevelopment, um, one part of the planning condition, again, was to provide a cycle park. Uh, it's three levels, uh, over just under 3,000 spaces. Uh, and it's very well used. Um, at the moment, pre-COVID, uh, pretty much all of the ground floor and first floor are full by by the morning really, morning rush hour, um, and this, the third floor is starting to fill up as well. Um, again, there are mainly double stackers, but there is the 20% um, of Sheffield stands for people who don't want to use the, the double stackers. Um, sorry, to, sorry to butt in, Claire. Uh, you've got like a couple more minutes if possible. I know you've got a few more slides, so I don't know whether you want to yeah. go through them quickly or, or cut a few out, but um, time is running out a bit. Okay. Uh, Theft is a, was a big problem in both stations, the new cycle park and at the new Cambridge North station. I know Matt's going to talk a little bit more about this, but these are just some of the things that the Great Anglia have responded um, to the issues. Uh, one of the issues is the type of rack and the fact that they're bolted in and, and the thieves were coming and just simply unbolting the Sheffield stand. So they have tamper proof bolts that are very important. Um, so, yes, I said, Matt, Matt will talk a little bit more about that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as I've sort of touched on, um, cargo bikes have, are becoming a, an issue in Cambridge. There are, we're, we're very fortunate and, and a lot of people are starting to use them to carry children around, um, become much more significant in the last few years, the number of these kind of bikes. Um, and as I've said in previous, they can be misused at the, the cycle points at the station. There is an area for cargo bikes, um, but there's just the standard rack there and they are misused despite the signage. So we found that these things are very important to put a different kind of either a different kind of rack or what we've tended to use is ground fixing on the left, um, this, an area of cycle parking in another, a different car park. And these were put in relatively recently. We had a stencil made, so it was very obvious 
that they were for cargo bikes and they've been used um you know it's really good usage you can see a, a better picture in, in the middle although there's no sense stencil i don't know if that's why it's not used as much um but but we found that these things stencil on the ground ground or different kind of rack and making sure that they're easily accessible um, is something to think about that they're the at the so there's a large uh, cycle part at the end of the row you know often obviously people have small children or if it's an adapted bike they may have a disability but so that they're they're the racks that are nearest at the entrance to the buildings um, is the important thing. So I think Matt will talk a little bit more about inclusive cycling as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, just a quick uh, overview of some of the on-street, there's a lot of on-street parking in, um, in Cambridge. City centre said so we did an audit recently and uh, got a lot of spaces. We've, we've still got about a thousand, more than a thousand unofficial parking at the same time. So um, there was a huge demand for, for cycle parking, particularly in the city centre, which we're trying to cater for, but um, rapidly running out of space. Um, we've put lots of cycle parking outside pubs, I don't know why, but around the city. Uh, we've looked at uh, voting stations recently. We did an audit of all of those, mainly churches, and put in um, lots of cycle parking there, followed by an, an audit was done by Park That Bike for us. Um, as you can see, just quickly, um, we started off in the um, sort of left hand, top left hand corner of the photo, you've got sort of quite robust design with a, a on street parking with an island, a bollard, and we went to the next photo, much simpler, much cheaper, and just as effective, just using two bollards at each end of the cycle parking. Um, in the, bot the bottom photos, you can see we did have a problem with clutter, with bikes falling over into pedestrian space. Um, so we looked at, we worked with Falco, um, with Falco to come up with a design that um, kept bikes in a lot, lot neater, uh, in a straight line, but trying to make it as easy as possible for people to use um, and you know, good blocking mechanisms, which is often a problem with those kind of stands. We have, unfortunately, you can see the inset photo problem with vandalism. They're a bit vulnerable to the, the wheel clamps being taken off. So we've, we've had to go back and re-weld some of them uh last slide please and these are just some of the things that um to try and look at how we're going to fit in more cycle parking in the city center area particularly some of the things that we're sort of grappling with at the moment i suppose um looking at how we manage the existing parking um to make it sort of a, a shorter stay um trying to expand the existing cycle parks and um looking at put, putting more on street and removing more car parking which is always a a good message to give. Thank you very much for listening. I'll um, hand over to Matt now. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Claire. You had loads of questions coming in, which we will come to at the end. Uh, lots of really interesting technical things that hopefully you'll be able to answer. So this is a bit of a two-hander in Cambridge, and our next speaker is Matthew Danish, who is from he's from CamCycle. Uh, I think it's fair to say probably the most effective cycling campaign in the UK, possibly the world. I mean, that's a big, big grandiose statement, but an incredible organization, one full time uh, member of staff, but managed to get lots of stuff done and an amazing relationship with the local authority. So uh, hopefully you'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, we're running out of time a bit, Matt, so I'm going to have to restrict you to about five minutes. So um, if you can zip through your slides, that'd be really useful. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for that introduction. I think there are quite a few other amazing groups out there as well. Uh, we have actually now hired two more people, so uh, hopefully we'll be able to do more, even more uh, great work. So thanks for that introduction. I just want to say really quickly that uh, everything Claire said is amazing, and the work she's done and the others at the City Council has really made a huge difference in Cambridge and in, in all the planning applications that we look at, at hundreds of them. So many of them already have good cycle parking. And we can assert uh, under the local plan that they, if they don't have good cycle parking arrangements, that they need to uh, fix their problems. So um, moving on to the next slide, please. Thanks. So just from, from a couple of things at Cambridge Station, uh, we've learned a lot of lessons. It's amazing to have a, a 2,800 uh, cycle parking um, facility at the station. However, unfortunately, over the last four years or so, it's, it's, it's really, um, suffered from a number of security problems. 
the uh, even the the tamper-proof bolts, the thieves have walked in and brute forced them out of the ground. So that wasn't good enough. They have to be embedded in the ground in the concrete. Uh, the CCTV system doesn't help when the police refuse to look at it. And in any case, um, many of the thieves wear hoodies and nowadays masks as well. So in a sense, that's really not a solution either. Uh, so it really, it's about you know classic building design and making sure there's people around, that people feel safe using the building, that things are cleaned up, um, that there's also good signage and, and people can find their way around. We still have a problem where people can't even find the building because it's not well marked. So there's a lot of things that could, could be improved there and it's an active area of discussion. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one that's really important to us here in Cambridge is helping people uh, use get on cycles, you know, no matter their ability. So for example, if they want to use if they need to use tricycle, if they want to use tricycles, hand cycles, recumbent hand cycles, tandems, we, we are very supportive of this. We we want to see cycling uh, be an option for as many people as possible. But of course, that means you need cycle parking and you need standards that support larger and wider cycles. And that's actually a, a very challenging thing because there's such a variety and diversity of cycles. Next slide, please. Um, so we've, of course, um, very supportive of the Wheels for Wellbeing charity in London, and they've done some work thinking about how uh, different types of cycles can be accommodated in cycle parking. Uh, and this just shows some of their thinking and their very excellent guide to inclusive cycling, which you, if you haven't seen, please do go to their website and download it. Um, so the, a few ideas include half-high Sheffield stands, uh, various types of ground anchors, and even a, a bespoke um, pole with a, a loop that one of their trustees has, has dreamed up. Next slide, please. They also include some recommendations about dimensions and uh, accessibility. It's important to think also, especially about how people with disabilities can access these cycle parking, especially if they have difficulty walking or dismounting, uh, you need to provide spaces that people can actually uh, get out of their cycle and, um, and use the locking facilities that are available. Next slide, please. Yeah, so I, I don't want to take up too much time. I just want to say that this stuff is very active in discussion. There is no magic bullet for security. It really does take, we're, we're thinking about all sorts of different solutions, but a lot of it is, you know, using uh, sensibility and uh, social safety and other, and other aspects of design. Uh, I'm also thinking about whether sensors could be used to detect things like angle grinders and other, uh, let's say, rather spectacular forms of breaking locks. Um, in terms of cycle parking, there's a, so many types of larger cycles. There's inclusive cycle parking, which is to help people with disabilities gain access to cycling facilities. And there's also larger cycle parking, so trailers and cargo bikes. They don't necessarily they have a lot of overlapping characteristics. They're not necessarily the same thing. Uh, inclusive cycle parking, for example, uh, needs to be it probably needs some sort of scheme uh, that makes it marked off and separate, uh, that it, it is designated specifically for people with disabilities. And larger cycle parking, you wanna make sure that um, it's actually available for use by people who, who can't fit into ordinary cycle parking spaces. Um, the, there's plenty of more work needed and do check out our website. We, we publish a, a magazine four times a year uh, with great uh, stories and covers about all sorts of aspects. And we work for more, better, and safer cycling for transport, open to all ages and abilities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, thanks for whizzing through that so quickly. So our final speaker is uh, Dean Ford, who is sales manager at CyclePods. Uh, and once again, thank, thank you very much, CyclePods, for sponsoring this um, webinar. Over to Dean. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Adam, for, for chairing. Um, thanks to Landor for hosting this event. Uh, we're really happy to be sponsoring it. Um, I'll try and go through the slides fairly, fairly quick because I know we're running a little late on time. Um, so, yeah, quick introduction. Obviously, I'm uh, Dean Ford and I'm the sales manager for CyclePods. So, let's see if we can get the slides working. Okay, so um, some of the, the panelists have already gone through some of the information on here, so I'll, I will be fairly quick going through it. 
um, the one size doesn't fit all is, is really key for this, um, short term versus long term parking. Um, so a Sheffield stand may be fine if you're going to be parking your bike outside a shop um, or outside somewhere you're just going to nip into for a courier, just dropping a parcel off into an office. Um, very short term, doesn't really matter if it gets rained on a little bit, um, absolutely fine. But if you're looking at parking for an office development, you know, you want to be leaving your bike there between nine and five. Um, it needs to be covered. It needs to be secure. Uh, you, you want to have that, um, that knowledge that when you're going to go back to your bike after finishing a hard day at work, your bike's still going to be there. So that's really important things to, to consider when you're, when you're looking at what type of parking to put in. Um, also, is it going to be temporary? Um, there's a lot of um, work going on at the moment about potentially councils and offices putting in temporary stands. You know, how long are these temporary stands going to be in there for? Is, is it the right solution to put in something which is not very secure? Or is it actually a better option to really look at a long term um, procurement solution uh, that will actually keep bikes safe? OK, a couple of features to avoid um, when, when looking at your uh, cycle parking. Um, as we've seen there in Cambridge, bolt down stands pulled out of the ground, broken at the base. Um, they can become easily cluttered. Uh, the picture on the top right there shows uh, someone's locked their bike through someone else's brake cable, which is very easily done. Um, and, and also, you know, the standard sort of Sheffield sand can be cut through with a, a fairly small angle grinder in under 30 seconds uh, and the bike's gone. So it really is key to look at security uh, on top of what may be the easiest thing to, to put in or the quickest solution. Um, again, as Matthew said, um, making sure that your storage is used. You know, people need to know it's there. You've got this great new facility, it's well lit, it's covered with CCTV, you've got bike detection in it, uh, but you've got no signs. People need to know where it is. Um, and it's important to look at um, the signage, not just to, to demarcate where the cycle parking is, but also any flow around it, whether you need to put one way in so that you can avoid people knocking into each other. Um, it's, it's a really important thing to have. Um, as they say, if you build it, they will come. Some other sort of key considerations you can see on the picture in the top right there. Um, there's, there's not exactly any manoeuvring space for those bikes. So if your bike's the one at the back there, you've got to sort of wade through the other wheels of the bikes, probably pick your bike up um, to a height where you, you need to lift it over the others and get it out. It's, it's certainly not ideal. So manoeuvring space is a really important thing to look at when you're planning in any cycle parking. Uh, what we do at Cycle Pods is we will actually draw um, the, the situations out. We will draw in the manoeuvring space as well. So it gives a real clear guidance as to what space is needed. Um, entrance and exits to the storage areas. Are they well lit, well marked? Um, is it one way in, in, one way out? Is it an in out? If it's an in out, then it needs to be a wider solution. Automatic doors, access control. It's all really important uh, and basic fundamental things that need to be um, installed within cycle parking to make sure that the user experience is, is, re is really up there. Um, don't block walkways, access routes, public areas, um, electric cupboards um, is one that I saw recently, another where uh, a bike was locked to um, a fire extinguisher rail. Um, all, all of these things where provision may not be quite enough at the moment, we need to look at other areas where we can actually identify for, for cycle parking without blocking up um, potentially um, life-saving equipment such as uh, fire, ex fire extinguishers. Um, in September last year, um, we, we want to, we decided um, as, a, as a company that we were going to stop selling products known as wheel benders. Um, they're not good for, for bikes, uh, bike falls over, the wheel gets bent, as many of you know. Uh, security on them is terrible. You can only lock one wheel, uh, and with most wheels being quick release, um, you know, it's a very quick way to steal 75% uh, of a bike. Um, so yeah, we've made a decision. We're not going to sell them anymore. They're, they're not good for cyclists. They're not good for the market. 
Um, so we don't offer them anymore. Um, Help me, sorry. Um, and also looking at other uh, potential uh, products to be used for different types of bikes. Um, so Cambridge, as you can see, have got these types of fold down loops, which go actually embedded into the ground. Um, they're, they're no touch. So you actually operate it with your foot. You slide your foot back and that lifts the loop up. The loop is solid, sold secure gold standard, um, a really good way of locking uh, recumbent bikes, cargo bikes. Um, another little feature is things like lock racks to put on the shelters um, or, or the end of trip facilities, start of trip facilities as well. Um, so people don't have to carry big heavy D locks around in their in their rucksacks all day. They can actually just leave them on there, safe in the knowledge that when they come back, they can just unlock their lock uh, and, and lock their bike up quite easily. Gas assisted two tier, um, as William said at uh, Chilton. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're happy to be providing the uh, the, the two tier systems at Princess Risborough, uh, Aylesbury, uh, um, uh, Marlebone. Um, children's storage. Um, a large uptake in inquiries coming through recently for scooter and cycle storage. And it's important to think about other provisions there. So we do shelters which have um, a row of lockers in them as well. So parents can actually put the helmets, gloves and things like that in the lockers, um, which are covered in the shelter. That way, the parents, after dropping their children off at school, don't have to carry around um, helmets and lockers and uh, helmets and gloves and things like that for the children. Uh, where they may have to go straight off to work if the school doesn't have another provision to, to have them stored. And then the smaller things as well, cycle pumps and repair stands, really, really key thing. If you've got a lot of cycle parking, um, they're a really good thing to have because people do get flats, people do need to repair their bikes. And these um, little bits of infrastructure are put in there so that people can uh, fix their bikes at the storage area um, well enough so that they can get home and then maybe do a more permanent repair but really key little things to think about. Uh, and then we're on to technology. Um, a lot going on with technology and cycle parking at the moment. It, it does seem that there's something fairly, fairly new coming out um, fairly often. Uh, one of the things that we're concentrating on at the moment is bike detection. So this enables um, the user to look at live data of how many cycle parking spaces are free um, how long the bikes have been parked there for, where they can actually set up um, parameters of what they would call an abandoned bike. So if a bike has been parked in the same space for, say, three weeks, uh, which is how it's set our Brighton hub, then that would actually flag up to the operator. This bike's been there for three weeks. Um, it's potentially abandoned. They can then go and deal with, with that bike, whether they put a notice on it to say you've got a week to remove it or whether they remove it at that point. Remember, this is live data that the bike detection um, actually gives us. Through this live data, we can actually install signs which tell you where the spaces are available, um, which is which is great in a, a large cycle parking um, uh, building. Um, and then lastly, um, I'm really good to hear from Cycle Hoop about the fact that they're getting so many inquiries on, on the hangers. Um, we're now going to show you a little video of our new hanger. Uh, this is a Dutch style hanger. Uh, and our hangar uses no keys. It's all powered by an app um, and a motorized cylinder. Um, and we are available to take inquiries on it now. So, um, yeah.
Uh, thanks for playing that video. Yeah, so as you can see, um, the, the new hanger, no keys, instant access, um, very, very easy to set up. Um, and from uh, downloading the app, which is powered by an American system that we've now got exclusivity with, um, you can have access to the hangar in under two minutes. Um, don't need to wait for any keys to be posted out or anything like that. So a, a real jump forward in, in the market. Um, and the actual cylinder inside it is, is motorized as well. Um, so as soon as you press the button to unlock, the lock unlocks itself and you've just simply got to lift it up. Um, so that's that's me done. Um, again, thanks to everyone and I'll be here for the, the question and answer. Thank you very much, Dean. Um, that was fantastic. Right, we're going to bring everyone in. So if all the panellists can... Uh, make themselves visible and turn on their microphones. Just while they do that, a couple of stats. I got a, a message from a gentleman saying that Salford is using bike hangers. So that's good to know. And uh, maybe when we get to the Q&A, maybe um, Dean can tell us if they've had inquiries from, from which, which parts of the country for the bike hangers. And also, just before I forget, I don't know if anyone saw the amazing video, I think Ned Rail made it about the new, uh, the Hague Central Station cycle parking facility that's open this week. 7,000 parking spots and it's all sort of digital uh, smartphone access. I mean, it's, it's, it's an incredible architectural work of art. Um, I mean, Cambridge is, is, is quite a stunning cycle parking facility but that's pretty much the only one we've got in the country like that uh, but the Dutch just continue to build incredibly beautiful and functional facilities and uh, hopefully we'll have a few more of those in this country soon right we're going to kick off we've, we've got lots of questions we've got about 20 minutes so the way it's going to work is I will uh, I'll read out the questions that have been sent in and I will allocate them to the various different speakers. Um, I'm going to ask the speakers to be really brief in their answers so we can get through as many as we can. Um, so we're going to kick off, right? We're going to do it, it's kind of easier for me. We're going to do it in the order that they came in and the order of the speakers. So the first few questions are going to be for William. Um, and the first question I've got is from Chris Tree who said, would TOX accept non-trained users using station cycle parking as part of the emergency active travel fund measures, given that numbers of passengers are low and likely to remain so in the short to medium term? So I guess that's really a question about security, uh, secure parking at stations. So William. Yeah, it's a question absolutely about security, also our operations. So our approach, I'll, yes, I'll try and keep this brief, but you know, the, our position is that cycle parking facilities are there for our customers, for rail users. I certainly recognize and um, uh, that uh, we don't have a lot of customers at the moment as a lot of people are working from home and it's not clear when they will return. We haven't yet sort of opened up um, our cycling facilities to the general public. And what I think is interesting about that is thinking about where our stations are on our route, they're not always necessarily in the town centre or on the high street. They tend to be you know, a little bit further off. So I'm not sure how useful it would necessarily be to, uh, to make cycle parking open to whoever wants to use it. Um, it does create some operational issues for us, particularly if people start to leave or abandon their bicycles there, and then we've got sort of no idea who they've come from and maybe run into liability issues. But it's an important, and I think quite a good point to make. This is an unprecedented time. We do need to be flexible. We do need to encourage people to cycle, even if they're not our customers. So it's one I'll take away with me. So thank you for that, um, Chris. Um, Okay, um, another one for William. Another brief answer, please, if possible. Uh, the old chestnut. What are you doing to make more cycle spaces available on your actual trains? Yeah, um, this is something which I didn't speak about in my presentation. Perhaps I should have gone to yeah a little bit on that. So our trains, our fleet is now relatively old. Given 
where we are in the franchise, um, we're unlikely to be able to get new ones like before it comes to an end, just because a leasing company isn't going to uh, want to um, sign an agreement with us for just a couple of years. Uh, in the future, and actually um, Greater Anglia, I think, have done relatively well on this with their new fleet. Um, the specification for it includes cycle provision on board the carriages, you know, with, uh, they've had some issues with it, I know, but the the thinking is in the right place. So the fleet that we have is older, as and when it's replaced, yes, we will be looking to, as far as possible, include you know, the, 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 the needs of cyclists in how these characters are laid out. There's a trade-off between capacity for just passengers and cycling spaces. So, you know, um, your peak time train, perhaps uh, you, you can't fit that many bicycles on there. Um, and when it comes to those peak time services, I would imagine that the restrictions on having a non-folding bicycle will remain in place for, you know, for the foreseeable. Of course, assuming that passenger numbers um, uh, return to where they were in February, and maybe will take a long time to get there. So again, it's 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 a good point. It's one that's really difficult for us operationally to to, to sort of balance it out. Um, it's yeah, but it is something that's on our radar. Okay, great. So a couple of quick ones. Um, uh, this is from Tariq, who asks about uh, COVID-19 uh, secure storage. So are you, are there any plans for someone like a talk like yourselves to sort of change the way that cycle storage is working because of COVID-19? That's the first, first, I'm going to throw another one at you as well, William, which is cycle crime at, at your stations. Um, is it an issue and how are you dealing with it? But two quick answers on that, please, yeah, William. Quick answers. Uh, I'll do my best. COVID-19 secure, yes. Um, all stations have social distancing measures in place, which includes you know, sort of one-way systems and, of course, just signage to guide customers as they're moving around to keep a safe distance. And that includes, or that's extended to the bicycle parking areas as well. Um, uh, Marlborough is by far the busiest, and there is if you like, a social distancing uh, guidance, messaging, and one-way systems in place to make sure people can access them securely and safely. And we have an enhanced cleaning regime for common touch points, like you know, ticket gates, the, um, the, uh, the bike racks themselves. Uh, cycle crime is a problem. Um, it's something which, you know, I get sort of updates on as and when it happens. We know where the hotspots are, and that is where we're focusing our effort on improving the quality of our cycle uh, the parking in future. So Banbury is one quite problematic area, and we've received funding earlier this year from the DFT Cycle Rail Fund to upgrade that, and we'll make sure that security is embedded in the design that emerges. Okay, great. Thanks, William. Okay, we're going to move on to some questions for Chris now. Um, first one is from Jane Bridge, and the question is actually two questions. Can you recommend a source for audit of residential parking for flats? Um, Jane says that we have an ongoing issues with developers not wanting to install due to loss of space, unattractiveness of shelters, and problems with maintenance misuse of communal shelters. Um, it says two questions, but that's only one question. So how about kicking off with that? And then we'll, I've got others for you as well, Chris. Sure. Thanks very much, Jane. Um, yeah, so the, the data source that we used for the CPIP implementation plan was essentially just a uh, an audit of the cycle hangers, uh, as this is something that is actually uh, available uh, and posted for each of the boroughs or most of the boroughs. Um, in, in terms of more specific cycle parking for residential buildings, that's not in terms of a... Uh, uh, an actual cycle hanger. Uh, that is one of the kind of blind spots uh, of the study that we've tried to, um, we, yeah, we've we, we basically tried to use things like the propensity to cycle tool to understand what kinds of flows might be existing um, to, to make up for that kind of blind spot. So um, yeah, in terms of cycle hangers, that information is, is available, but uh, other kind of informal or, or location specific cycle parking, that, uh, that's something that we've had to kind of use a proxy for. Okay, great. Um, next question is, um, this is from Linda. Did the exercise in Lambeth cover residential areas or just town centres? Yes, so uh, all of the cycle parking strategies as is have been focusing on 
uh, not necessarily town centres, uh, but certainly areas where there are um, likely cycle destinations. So, for example, some of them would be train stations in addition to town centres. Um, but we've we've also kind of covered off in in, in for example Lambeth, um, a, a large area around uh, the South Bank. So uh, that in itself is maybe not a town centre per se. Um, but in terms of residential locations, uh, that's something that was not included in the cycle parking strategy. Um, that, that we did for Lambeth, um, but that's something that I think is being uh, looked at separately by the borough. Okay, great stuff. Um, Stephen Lloyd-Jones would like to know what is TfL's attitude to cycle parking at stations outside London, Example, F, for example, Epping, Watford, Rickmansworth, Amersham? Ooh, uh, that unfortunately is not an answer I, I have at the moment. Um, yeah, that, that would probably be a question best directed to, to TfL themselves. Okay. Uh, another quick one. Is the CPIP a public document from Gavin Wood? Yes, Gavin. So if you if you search online cycle, uh, cycle parking implementation plans uh, TFL, you should be able to find it on the, the first uh, page of results. Okay, great. And Jane had another quick one. Can you recommend an audit of residential cycle stands and stores? We have a lot of pushback from developers due to cost, lots of space, etc. I think that might. I don't know if that's linked to the same. The other question, or is it? Mm -hmm. uh, Sorry, I've lost track whether it's, if it's the same or an am amendment to the other question that she asked. Yes, I mean, that, so that that was not something included in in the commission that that, that we were working on for TfL, um, but it's certainly something that if there is, um, you know, a, an interest in um, that, that maybe they they might be interested in looking at that as well. Um, but that's not something that we we personally worked on yet. Okay, great stuff. Right. Um... This is an interesting question from Jonathan Law, and this is something I've never actually heard anyone talk about, but I think it's really relevant because we we get a bit obsessed by parking at train stations, but this is a question about cycle racks in rural bus stops. So it's a really good point because uh, people might want to cycle to a to a bus stop, leave their bike there securely, jump on the bus. So um, I don't know if anyone, uh, maybe this is a question for Claire, actually, or Claire, maybe, and Dean. I mean, Dean might have installed some, but maybe Claire, have you got any thoughts on um, installing secure parking at rural bus stops? Um, yeah, I mean, up till now, we have put in a few. They, they tend to be just Sheffield stands, so uh, tend to be one or two Sheffield stands at places where there's demand. Uh, that's um, We haven't put any... We, what we have done is for um, some of the park, the smaller park and rides that are on the busway, um, we've put lockers in for um, for people for more secure. Because obviously people take their bike, they then they drive there, they get on their bike and go on the busway, um, the, the cycleway next to the busway. So we have put quite a number of lockers, in, and there's quite demand for more. So we're probably going to put some more in. So there's there's Sheffield covered Sheffield stands and lockers along the busway that's where we've got the highest demand in more rural areas where um, the demand is not quite so high we have put in as I say one or two um, Sheffield stands where we've been asked to yeah I okay, think from, from our point of view on yeah sorry I, I think from our point of view when it comes to sort of bus uh, bus shelters and things like that um, it's not something that comes up very often I think the difference with uh, between sort of uh, bus stops and train stations are, you know, a train station is a really large hub, um, whereas a bus stop is, is one small part of, of that sort of uh, um, uh, public transport. There tends to be a lot more bus stops, so the provision needed at each bus stop is very, very small normally, um, and the bus stops tend to be a lot closer to people's start um, location than potentially a train station. So that's why you get people cycling to a train station maybe a few miles, but it may only be 100, 200 yards potentially to a, to a bus stop. I think that's why there's not so much provision. We have done lockers and things like that at bus stops um, and bus uh, bus station hubs for, but not really anything um, a, a very small sort of bus stops rurally. Okay, great stuff. So um, we've got lots of questions and uh, we're going to go until 10 past 12. Uh, so we've got 20 minutes left of this session, of this webinar. Um, so we're going to kick off, we're going to carry on. Okay, question for Claire. This is from Thomas Lancaster. Question is, if the local neighbourhood plans have already been adopted, 
how can my local borough stroke town apply cycle parking guidelines to new developers quite a technical one there claire over to you <laughs> i'm not sure now um, i'm the best person to answer that um i think it, if the neighborhood plans have already been approved uh, that's it it's it's really for the next the next iteration is to get um is to lobby your members etc and the, the the local authority to get standards in um for the next iteration but i mean they can they can ask developers to put in um provision but unless there's some some approved standards that have gone through the process um you can't force that to happen okay that's great um this is a question i think i'm going to ask chris this is probably come under his expertise it's from andrew spittlehouse do residential parking standards cover visitors as well as residents um so i think th this is one that will be uh, slightly different per location um so it, in in general it does uh it, it does uh have some allocation for for visitors but at the same time um, there's a bit of wiggle room in there uh, for, for kind of visitors, but also maybe you know, deliveries and things like that. So um, it, it generally would include uh, some sort of provision, but there's there's not necessarily a specific amount, um, and, and it will also vary kind of by borough and location. Okay, great. Um, these did come in order, so they seem to be, be, be a bit heavily uh, skewed towards Claire at the moment. Uh, I mean, feel free to pass them on to Matthew, Claire, uh, but they will we'll, we'll have others for other questions for other people coming up. So, uh, Claire, uh, simple one, is the Cambridge guidance available online? That's from Jane Bridge. Uh, yes, it's on the City Council website. Um, so, yeah, if you just Google cycle parking guidance, Cambridge City Council, you'll get it. Great. OK, another one for Claire. Uh, say re the station this is from uh edward holden regarding the station cycle point is technology used to indicate to cyclists where spaces are available i.e reduce user dwell time um there was i don't the question was is there that the answer is no there isn't but that i know that uh greater anglia are looking i think it was on one of my slides are looking at um, a census, of, you know, as as um, Dean talked about, that cycle pods have, um, and I'm sure others are available. Um, so they are looking at that both from a from the point of view of uh, showing people what racks are available. So obviously it's it's three floors, so it's quite useful to know if there's any space, you know, on this on the first floor, so you don't have to walk round to then go on to the next floor. So I think that would be a fantastic tool and, and promotional tool as well for both for the station and for the other cycle parks in Cambridge. Um, they're also looking at it from the point of view of theft, because if you know when a bike was moved in a certain spot, if someone's reported a theft, it makes it a lot easier to go through the CCTV footage to, to find out when that happened. So they're looking at it from that point of view. Um, I think the problem with, um, and, and also, um, looking at it from the point of view it, with abandoned you know with bikes that are there from a long time it means it's much easier to remove bikes that have, have been left um it's much more you know bikes have been there for a few weeks and um they can much be efficiently moved um a lot quicker um so yeah it's it, it's something that's being looked at obviously there's a cost involved um and with regard to i mean we've sort of looked at the set for using those sensors for um say on street parking going slightly away from the question but um but then it's a it's a problem of having the staff resources to actually use that information to then go and remove the, the the bikes okay it's quite a few questions on cambridge obviously uh you guys are doing some interesting stuff so people want to know how how you do it uh okay uh this is question well this could be for uh William or Claire, and maybe even Dean, so you can choose who wants to answer it. Maybe William could go first. Is there anywhere to charge electric bikes? Um, this is from Claire Fleming. So it's kind of, I guess it's a quick yes or no answer. 
the answer is no at present, and I'm not sure necessarily that the use case is there for people wanting to do it. Um, so just to very briefly add a little bit more, this was discussed quite recently at um, the Cycle Rail working group within the industry of sort of my counterparts elsewhere. There's a lot of security issues both in terms of theft, but also potentially fires and that kind of thing of having these factories, you know, all plugged into. Um, so at the moment, no, it's something that's been discussed. We'll look for solutions, but you know, um, is it necessary? I suppose will people will not rather charge it up at home rather than leave an expensive battery in public where it might be nicked. So, okay, uh, Dean, do you want to? Are you are you guys putting that in your in your proposals? We're actually finding we're getting less inquiries on it. More people are, are, are sort of mentioning it, but when it comes to the actual inquiry, we're getting less. Um, I think one of the reasons for that is the batteries on e-bikes, like, like the bikes themselves, are improving and evolving. So they last longer, so people don't necessarily need to charge them when they get to the cycle parking. Um, we can do lockers which have um, sort of power sockets in them. But as William has said, you know, there are still some fairly sort of shoddy e-bike batteries um, laying about in places which you know they're, they're the type of thing that unfortunately can cause quite nasty fires if they're constantly charged they don't some don't have a thermal cutoff um, which is which is not great um, so you've got to weigh the risk of need versus um, potential risk okay um i think we're sort of wrapping up cambridge questions but I'm, there's a couple more good ones um this, this is one I'm particularly interested in, actually. Uh, this is from Julie Barnes, who says, I'm interested in Cambridge removing pay and display car parking. How do you work this as a council with losing revenue income? Some authorities face challenges with this, so interested in how you manage that. And this also goes, the next one question from Pete Salvin, goes nicely with this. As better quality, more secure parking is provided, are how are cycle parking charges considered to cover costs and offset losses from removed car parking? This is something I, I think I think this issue around loss of income from car parking is a really pertinent one. I mean, I know that the borough I happen to live in, which is Harringay, have been losing, I think, £350,000 a week due to during the COVID um, crisis because they've had no uh, on street. They basically got rid of all the parking charges. It's a massive amount of money over, you know, 10 weeks. And, th and then they bought then they brought the parking in stack then they brought it back in a very staggered way so it's probably going to be about 12 weeks loss of income so i'm really interested to know from claire i think mainly claire um how do you sort out this issue of loss of income and are you going to start charging for cyclists for their high quality cycle parking um well I, the main thing it's been a, a long long process so it's you know the initial arguments, arguments for little discussions with um, colleagues in parking was, you know, no chance, we need the income. Um, and then it was, then it sort of, it was very slowly, slowly. So the next stage is, uh, was, um, okay, well, perhaps in these spaces, because the income isn't that great, we, you know, people, it's not used that well, so you can use those. And then it slowly increased. And I think mainly it's that the priorities of members have changed and, and they could see the importance of cycling in Cambridge. The demand is so high for cycle parking in the centre. There's a problem with bikes clattering the footways. And it, so to a certain extent, it's a change in priority politically, um, that they're prepared to take the hit of um, the income from car parking. And, and also at the same time as, as that's happening, the, the we're looking at, actually trying to remove car parking for, sorry remove cars from the city centre so we're trying to prevent people we've already got the core scheme which has uh, the bus gates which stops some car journeys but we're looking to expand that with the city access project is is trying to reduce cars in the city centre area so that that makes it a lot easier for the argument that we should be removing the pay and display spaces um, our problem is trying is isn't now we're sort of we're trying to look at res, you know where we want to put cycle parking in in residential areas where um it's all on street parking and that basically is actually a lot more difficult for us at the moment okay great stuff right we've got about 10 minutes um i'm really grateful for the panel staying so long um 
we, we were due to finish at 11.45, so very, very grateful for that. So we're going to just keep um, going through these questions. Um, question for Dean. What would what would they recommend as a temporary cycle storage option as an alternative to Sheffield stands? Temporary options needed to provide for imminent return to work from COVID-19 lockdown. That's from Andrew Rally. Okay, so for, for me on that, Andrew, it would be, um, you need to analyze what that need is gonna be and how long that need is gonna be for. If you think that the need is gonna be for three months, um, it may be fine for you to purchase some toast racks um, and put them in, bolt them down, um, and, and that may cover what you need to do. Um, so for example, you're spending 400 pounds on a toast rack, which will sort out parking for 10 bikes for a temporary measure, that's absolutely fine. You've got to remember, obviously, they're not the most secure things in the world. Um, you know, bikes can be fairly easily stolen from them and they can be cut through fairly easily with, with some sort of small power tools. Whereas uh, we, do, we do a product called a street pod, um, two bikes, 330 quid. Um, and that's something that you could put in anywhere because they just get bolted down and then move them to another area when you find a permanent home, potentially. It's a bigger investment, but you've got something that's gonna last 10, 20 years and something that's secure, rather than just looking at a, a very quick reaction of, right, we just need to get 20 spaces in. However, it does depend on the individual need and how many extra spaces you need to put in. Okay, um, I've had a few questions about, this is Dean, let's stick with you. Uh, I've had a few questions about the app and using a smartphone. Uh, what happens if you run out of battery power on your app and you can't access the hangar or if you don't have a smartphone? And uh, another one, um, I know people have had issues with accessing keyless cars operated by mobiles, not being able to get in, low battery, no Wi-Fi, lost phone, locked phone in car, etc. So I guess the question is, if you are using one of your keyless bike hangers, uh, what are the options if there's smartphone failure or 4G failure or something like that? Um, so on, on the functionality, it looks like there is a provision that we could either potentially um, open it from from a distance um, other than that uh, and that that's in development at the moment the actual remote opening um, the other option that we've got on there is uh, that there are potentially keys available um, but it's not a solution we want want to go down um, we would much prefer that people do use the app um, and it's like you know if, if your battery is low it's normally somewhere you can charge your battery it, it takes a couple of minutes and and, and you can open it um there isn't really a if you if you don't have a smartphone then it, it may not be accessible to you and one other question can existing cycle, sorry can existing cycle hangers be retrofitted with the app lock uh only um it's it's a completely exclusive system to cycle pods um so if it's a different manufacturer then no Okay, a uh, question for, Claire, this is from Valentin, a uh, question for Claire or Matthew. In light of the rising interest in cycling from COVID-19, have any of you had to provide additional temporary cycle parking to accommodate those new users? And if so, what type of facilities have you used? Uh, I believe that is something that we're looking at, some additional temporary par um, cycle parking, but I, I don't have any details as yet of what we're gonna put in and where. Sorry. Okay. Um, Mike Woolacott is interested in e-scooter parking provision. So every, I'm sure uh, you guys are aware that the government announced the e-scooter trials, which I think kick off tomorrow in Middlesbrough. Uh, there hasn't there hasn't been much published about it, although we know they're happening and they've set out the guidance, but they haven't published a list of places that are going to be taking part in the trials. We know 50 councils. Uh, were interested in taking part in the trials. We also know that there's no money from DFT for these trials. They have to be funded um, within by by the local authority and by the uh, by the uh, scooter uh, company. So, anyone like to talk about e-scooter parking provision? I mean, be bear in mind that at the moment the only thing that is legal is hire scooters. 
So I guess maybe moving forward, people like William would be thinking about um, if if the trials go ahead successful and e-scooters are road legal, then maybe Tox will start thinking about e-scooter parking provision. But as it stands at the moment, has anyone got any comments about e-scooter parking provision? Dean, maybe I don't know. Is it something on your radar? Yeah, we, we've, yes, yeah, it's, it's certainly on our radar. We've we've had a couple of um, companies come to us and to to look at. Uh, potential designs that we can manufacture for them um, you know, and, and that's that's about as far as it is at the moment um, we really need to see how the trials go we, we, we've got a number of designs that we can use and um, they're fairly straightforward uh, docking systems so I think we, we've really got to watch this space uh, and see how, how the trials go okay um, got a, sorry anyone else want to come in no okay uh, just a really good comment, actually, from Chris, who is one of Dean's colleagues at CyclePods. He said, Lambeth are implement this is not related to e-scooters, Lambeth are implementing residential parking following recommendations after the Grenfell fire not to store bikes on balconies or in corridors. So uh, that's really quite interesting. And maybe if Chris has got any more information on that, maybe he could share that via, via Dean and we could get that circulated because that's that's going to be quite interesting to, you know, with, with e-scooters, with e-bikes, the, the potential of fire is is obviously greater than a than a non non-battery powered vehicle. So um right, uh, we've got literally a couple of minutes, maybe one minute. I'm gonna um uh right, funding okay. I think it's actually one it's the first question that came in from Constant McColl. Um what funding schemes are available or will be available for cycle parking? Uh, maybe it's one for Claire actually to answer. Uh, I mean, Chris also might have some thoughts on this, but Claire, do you want to go first and then Chris have a have a go? Um, what nationally or? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, well, in England. Um, Let's talk about England because that's that's so kind I, of it's is a um, bit different. Scotland and Wales. I'm not. I mean, I'm I'm aware of the the. Uh, there's a there's a to say that there's a bid in for um, station secure secure station station cycle parking, which um, Greater Anglia have put a bid in for. Um, uh, I mean, as say part of part of the the pop up schemes um, temporary schemes, there is funding potentially available for cycle parking, but I don't <laughs> have specific funds available. Um, I'm afraid. Okay, uh, Chris, have you got any? Might have more yeah, I mean, through through our experience uh, working with several boroughs uh, on on street space uh, work, at, at least in London, um, some of the the cycle parking bits are, are likely to come through in the kind of tranche two work uh, or the tranche two phase of funding. Um, but it's still a bit in flux at the moment. Um, but that that's where we're going to start to to expect at least some cycle parking to come through. Okay. Um, right. I think we're going to wrap it up there, guys. It is nine minutes past twelve. I'd like to thank very much the panel. Um, fantastic presentations, really informative answers. Uh, I'd like to thank CyclePods again for sponsoring this and thank massive uh, thanks to the people behind the scenes to make this happen. This is, uh, it, it worked really seamlessly and uh, it was a, a big technical and production effort to get this off the ground. So uh, this is the 14th. Uh, of these sessions there's quite a few more to come they'll be on the land or links website and hope you can join us for some more thanks very much thank you, thank you.